Hello, and welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Biologics Patent Briefing, Prosecution, Post-Grant Proceedings, and Litigation. I am Tom Sullivan, and I will be your moderator today. It is my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Shana Sear and Mark Feldstein. Shana and Mark are Finnegan partners who secure, defend, and enforce patent rights for pharmaceutical and biological products. Their vast experience includes patent prosecution and portfolio management, post-grant trial proceedings at the USPTO, patent infringement actions in the U.S. District Courts, and appeals. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. To do so, please click on the red Q&A button at the lower center of the webcast interface. Type your question into the Q&A window and then click Submit. You can submit questions throughout the program and our question and answer session will take place at the end. To enlarge the slide window, please click on the green Enlarge Window button on the top right side of the slideshow. The slides will advance automatically throughout the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow Webcast Help Guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. Now I will turn it over to Shannon and Mark to begin our presentation, Biologics Patent Briefing, Prosecution, Post-Grant Proceedings, and Litigation. Welcome, Shannon and Mark. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tom, and welcome, everyone. During today's webinar, we will briefly introduce Biologics, discuss the patent dance and some exemplary BIPCA litigations, and then talk about post-grant challenges of biologic patents. We will then look at examples and provide tips relating to patent eligibility, written description, and obviousness. Biological patent is defined by statute and regulation as a virus toxin, antitoxin, vaccine, blood, protein, or other such product applicable to the prevention, treatment, or cure of a disease or condition. The FDA reports that in contrast to small molecule drugs, biologics are generally derived from living material and are complex in structure. So as shown on the slide, the structure of the biologic filgrestim is larger and more complex than that of the small molecule drug aspirin. And in fact, filgrastum is shown on this slide as only five times larger, where in reality it is about 100 times larger. Over 450 biologics have been approved to date, including the nine shown on this slide. Starting in 2003, biologics are approved and regulated by either the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, or its Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, or CBER. We will be looking at these nine exemplary biologics as we discuss biosimilars, BIPCA litigations, and IPRs. To market a biologic, a company must file a biologic license application, or BLA, with the Food and Drug Administration. The BLA must demonstrate that the product is safe, pure, and potent. A company may obtain approval for a biosimilar product by filing an abbreviated biologic license application, or ABLA. By statute, biosimilar means, one, that the product is highly similar, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components, and two, that there are no clinically meaningful differences in terms of safety, purity, or potency. An interchangeable product is one that is biosimilar and can be expected to produce the same clinical result in any given patient. In addition, the risk of switching between the interchangeable product and the reference product must be no greater than when just using the reference product alone. Approved biologics, biosimilars, and interchangeables are listed in the FDA's Purple Book, along with information such as the date of licensure and the expiration date for the reference product's exclusivity. Unlike the FDA's orange book for small molecule drugs, the purple book does not list patent information. Note that the purple book actually includes two lists, one from CEDAR and one from CBER. So if you're looking for a product in the purple book, make sure that you're checking both lists. Looking to our nine exemplary biologics, you can see on the slide that each is listed in the CDER part of the purple book and each has corresponding biosimilars that have been approved as well. So let's turn now to BIPCA litigation. 
Filing a license application seeking approval to engage in the commercial manufacture, use, or sale of a biologic before expiration of a patent is an act of infringement under 35 U.S.C. 271E2C. E2C for biologics is similar to 271E2A. Under E2A, filing an ANDA or 505B2 application seeking approval to engage in the commercial manufacture, use, or sale of a drug before expiration of a patent is an act of infringement. So 271E2A infringement for drugs generally plays out in Hatch-Waxman litigation. First, the new drug applicant lists patents in the FDA's orange book. Then an applicant files an ANDA or a 505B2 application with a paragraph 4 certification. The certification alleges that the patent is either invalid or not infringed. Within 20 days, the applicant provides notice of its paragraph 4 certification to the NDA holder and patent owners. The notice includes a detailed statement about the applicant's invalidity and non-infringement positions, as well as an offer of confidential access to the application. The NDA holder and patent owners then file suit within 45 days, which generally triggers a 30-month stay of approval for the ANDA or 505B2 application while the patent litigation takes place. The steps leading to BIPCA litigation are generally more complex. The steps are called the patent dance and are governed by 42 USC 262L. The numbers at the top of the boxes on this slide represent the statutory subsection. So starting from the top left, the ABLA is filed and the FDA accepts it for review. Under L1 and 2, the applicant has 20 days to provide the application and other confidential information to the reference product sponsor. Under L3A, the sponsor provides a patent list within 60 days. The patents listed are ones that the sponsor believes could reasonably be asserted. The sponsor also must must identify which of the patents, if any, it would be prepared to license to the applicant. Another 60 days later, under L3B, the applicant provides a patent list and a detailed statement with its invalidity and non-infringement positions. The sponsor then provides its detailed statement of infringement and validity positions 60 days later under L3C. Under L4, the sponsor and applicant negotiate a final list of patents, and then the sponsor files suit within 30 days under L6. If the sponsor and applicant do not agree on a final list after 15 days, then under L5, the applicant identifies the number of patents for the suit and the parties simultaneously exchange a list of that many patents. The sponsor then files suit within 30 days. In a second phase of BIPCA litigation governed by L8 and 9, the applicant provides notice at least 180 days before its first commercial marketing. Case law tells us that this notice can be given before or after the ABLA is approved. The sponsor can then seek an injunction as to any patent on the party's initial list that was not litigated, and the applicant or the sponsor can file a DJ action as to those same patents. So how is BIPCA litigation different from Hatch-Waxman litigation? Four differences are shown on this slide. First, in Hatch-Waxman litigation, the applicant provides notice of its application through the paragraph 4 notice. In BIPCA litigation, this occurs during the patent dance when the applicant provides its application and other confidential information to the sponsor. Second, In Hatch-Waxman litigation, the applicant first provides its invalidity and non-infringement positions in its paragraph 4 notice. But in BIPCA litigation, this occurs during the patent dance when the applicant provides its detailed statement with its positions. Third, the patents litigated in Hatch-Waxman cases are generally those listed in the orange book, whereas BIPCA litigation generally involve patents identified during the patent dance. And fourth, filing a Hatch-Waxman litigation generally triggers a 30-month stay of approval, but this is not available in BIPCA litigation. 
Instead, the patent owner in a BIPCA litigation may need to seek a preliminary injunction. So once the litigation starts, there are a lot of similarities between Hatch-Waxman litigation and BIPCA litigation. This includes with regard to proving infringement and defending against validity challenges. The available remedies are also similar. As provided in 271E4, remedies include injunctions preventing the biologic or the drug from being approved until the patent expires, damages if the product has been commercially manufactured, used, or sold, and possible attorney fees. As of last October, both Hatch-Waxman litigations and BIPCA litigations require that settlements be reported to the FTC and the DOJ. So let's talk more about the patent dance. The statute and case law give us information about what happens if the applicant takes or avoids certain actions. First, the applicant likely cannot avoid the patent dance altogether by filing a declaratory judgment action because the action would likely lack adequate case or controversy. Second, if the applicant does not provide a copy of its application or other required information, the sponsor may not force them to do so with an injunction. Instead, the sponsor, but not the applicant, may file a DJ action. Third, if the applicant does not provide a patent list or a detailed statement, the sponsor may file a DJ action as to any patent on the initial list. Fourth, the sponsor may also file a DJ action if the applicant does not identify a number of patents or participate in the simultaneous exchange. Fifth, if the applicant does not provide the required notice of commercial marketing, the sponsor may file a DJ action as to any patent identified on either initial list. The statute and case law also give us information about what happens if the reference product sponsor takes or avoids certain actions. First, if the sponsor does not timely identify a patent, then it may not be able to bring a BIPCA action as to that patent. Second, if the sponsor is unsure whether to list a patent, they should likely list the patent anyway, see what the applicant says about it in their detailed statement, and then decide whether to sue on that patent. Third, if the sponsor does not timely file suit, then their remedy for infringement may be limited to a reasonable royalty under 271E6. So looking back to our nine exemplary biologics, they have been involved in 21 BIPCA litigations. Nine are still pending, as shown in orange, and seven have been dismissed by stipulation, as shown in blue. One of these BIPCA litigations has resulted in a judgment of infringement, as shown in green. And I have an asterisk there because the court in that case also issued a judgment of non-infringement as to another patent in the suit. These decisions are currently on appeal. As shown in red, there has been one judgment of non-infringement, which was affirmed by the Federal Circuit, two summary judgments of non-infringement, which are on appeal, and one dismissal for failure to state a claim of infringement, which is also on appeal. So this slide shows the 21 BIPCA litigations represented in the pie chart we just looked at, with color coding corresponding to that in the pie chart. So I'd like to look now at the one infringement decision, which is the one in green, and the four non-infringement decisions, which are the ones in red. So the infringement decision is from the District of Delaware in 2018 and currently on appeal. After Hospira filed an abbreviated biologic license application for an epigen biosimilar, Amgen sued Hospira for infringement of patents identified during the patent dance. The jury found all of the claims valid, uh, the asserted claims of one patent not infringed, and the asserted claims of another patent infringed. The jury further found that 14 of Hospira's 21 batches were not entitled to the safe harbor defense 
and awarded Amgen $70 million in damages. The judge denied both parties' motions for judgment as a matter of law, and both parties appealed. So those appeals are now pending. The first non-infringement decision is from 2016, and this was affirmed by the Federal Circuit in 2017. After Apotex filed an abbreviated application for Nupagen and Nulasta biosimilars, Amgen filed suit on a patent identified during the patent dance. After a bench trial, the Southern District of Florida issued a judgment of non-infringement. Although letters that were exchanged during the patent dance had indicated that Apotex used a protein concentration encompassed by the claimed range, the court relied on testimony by Apotex's fact witness to the contrary. Notably, Amgen did not assert infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. The Federal Circuit affirmed this judgment of non-infringement. It found no error in the district court's decision to credit the fact witness testimony over the inaccurate letters. The Federal Circuit also wrote that there was no reason to disturb the ruling based on the mere existence of other batch records that may have had different data because Amgen did not demonstrate that discovery was restricted or that evidence was excluded. The next non-infringement decision is from 2017 and currently on appeal. After Sandoz filed ABLAs for Nupagen and Nulasta biosimilars, but did not provide copies of its applications to Amgen, Amgen sued for patent infringement anyway. The parties stipulated to validity and non-infringement of one patent after claim construction, but the parties reserved the right to appeal that claim construction order. For the other patent, the Northern District of California granted summary judgment of non-infringement. It found that Sandoz's method did not include distinct washing and eluding as required by the claims, and it also found no infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. Amgen has appealed the summary judgment as well as the claim construction order, and that appeal is pending. In the next case, Amgen filed an infringement suit against Coherus in the District of Delaware. In this case, the court granted Coherus's motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim of infringement, and this case has also been appealed by Amgen, and the appeal is pending. This last non-infringement decision was issued in 2018 and is also on appeal. In this case, Janssen filed suit based on patents identified in a previous suit. The court granted summary judgment of non-infringement, finding that Janssen would need to rely on the doctrine of equivalence, but that its asserted scope of equivalence would ensnare the prior art. So as I said, Janssen has appealed, and this one is also pending. So here we have some litigation tips. Applicants should, one, consider possible outcomes when deciding whether to initiate a patent dance and deciding when to provide commercial marketing notice. They should, two, consider non-infringement positions, including under the doctrine of equivalence, and three, consider invalidity positions. Four, applicants should monitor and make strategic decisions based on developments in the law. Reference product sponsors should, one, develop a strong patent portfolio that can be enforced against infringers and withstand validity challenges. Two, sponsors should consider possible outcomes when deciding which patents to identify during the patent dance and how to respond to a commercial marketing notice. Sponsors should, three, prepare for infringement suits as a result of the dance as well as declaratory judgment actions just in case the applicant does not comply with the dance. Sponsors should also, four, consider literal infringement and infringement under the doctrine of equivalence, and five, consider validity positions early on. Six, sponsors, like applicants, should monitor and make strategic decisions based on developments in the law. As we have seen, the law is changing, and there are multiple BIPCA litigations and appeals pending. So let's turn now to post-grant challenges of biologic patents. Post-grant challenges include post-grant reviews, 
which are filed no later than nine months after issuance and based on any ground other than best mode. They also include inter-parties reviews, which are generally filed more than nine months after issuance and based on 102 or 103 grounds. So looking to the patents for our nine exemplary biologics, they have been involved in 81 IPRs. 11 of these are pending, as shown in orange. 34 resulted in institution being denied, as shown in purple. 12 were dismissed or terminated, as shown in blue. And as shown in green, there have been nine final written decisions upholding patent claims two of which are on appeal. As shown in red, there have been 15 decisions finding all claims unpatentable, and 12 of these are on appeal. So the next four slides, as I flip through, show these 81 IPRs that are represented in the pie chart. And again, the color coding corresponds to that that was in the pie chart. So institution of an IPR may be denied under 314A, 325D or 315B. It may also be denied if a reference is not actually prior art or if there is no reasonable likelihood that the petitioner would prevail with respect to at least one claim. Claims are upheld in final written decisions if a reference is not prior art, if a claim limitation is not present in the prior art, if there was no motivation to combine or modify the references, if there was no reasonable expectation of success, or if there are unexpected results or other objective indicia of non-obviousness. So I'd like to look at the Pfizer versus Genentech IPR related to Herceptin. In this case, the board denied institution under 314A, which provides that institution requires a reasonable likelihood that the petitioner will prevail with respect to at least one claim. Pfizer petitioned for a second IPR and then moved to join it with a first IPR that had already been instituted. The board responded by denying institution, writing that the second petition relied on similar disclosures in the prior art and made substantially the same arguments as the first. IPRs may also be denied institution under two other statutes. Under 35 U.S.C. 325D, uh, this looks to whether the same or substantially the same art or arguments were previously presented. We are also seeing institutions denied under 315B, which bars petitions from being filed more than one year after an infringement complaint is served on the petitioner or the real party in interest. In preparing their positions at the petition stage and upon institution, both petitioners and patent owners should consider whether references are in fact prior art. So this was an issue in the Celtrion and Pfizer IPRs against a Biogen patent for Rituxan. In this case, the board found that one of the references that the petitioners relied on was not a printed publication under 102B. So the board then upheld the patentability of the claims, finding that the other references that were cited did not render the claims obvious. Uh, the petitioners in this case appealed, but actually as of yesterday, that appeal was dismissed by stipulation. So here we have some IPR tips. Petitioners should, one, develop arguments not previously presented. Two, petitioners should be aware of deadlines and possible time bars. They should, three, provide evidence to show that references relied on are prior art. Four, fully explain arguments on the merits. And five, monitor and make strategic decisions based on developments in the law. Patent owners should, one, consider procedural reasons for the board to deny institution. Two, consider arguments that cited references are not, in fact, prior art. Patent owners should, three, develop arguments on the merits, and four, monitor and make strategic decisions based on developments in the law. As we saw with BIPCA litigation, there are multiple IPRs for biologic patents and appeals of those IPRs currently pending. And with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Sheena. 
I'm going to turn now to some of the substantive issues uh, related to biologic patents, specifically patent eligibility, written description, and obviousness um, to see, looking at some cases and decisions, try to find some guidance for uh, at the very beginning, which way to prosecute, how to claim your, your biologic inventions, and then, of course, it will also back uh, into the litigations and the challenges that Shannon did. So we'll start with eligibility. Um, the, the statute is there. Whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent, therefore. Um, by itself, it's actually not that informative. Uh, it's not particularly not that informative of how it's been applied in practice. It's been modified substantially by judicial exceptions, abstract ideas, laws of nature, and natural phenomenon are designated ju judicial exceptions to eligible subject matter. And you know everyone in the patent field knows that this is a moving target and quite dynamic and uh, continuing to change uh, just how how broadly the judicial exceptions are applied to preclude um, inventions from being eligible subject matter. So if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, we have part of a new flowchart from the PTO trying to explain and shortcut the process for a, st a streamlined analysis for how you determine whether or not a claimed invention falls within the judicial exceptions to 101 or not. So the, the real key to this new um, process by the, F, by the PTO is this prong two at the bottom. Does the claim recite additional elements that integrate the judicial exception into a practical application? And this is, this is going to be where it seems that the PTO is trying to help tip the process, tip the analysis to finding things, finding inventions to be patentable. Because even if you recite one of the ju judicial exceptions, if you have additional elements that integrate the exception into a practical application, that'll take you out onto the left-hand side of this slide, and it'll qualify as eligible subject matter. So we can look at some examples of this. Um, in this case, this genetic technologies case, there was a claim, a method of detecting at least one coding region allele of a multi allelic genetic locus. And there's an amplifying step. And basically what you're doing is, basically what they're doing was amplifying a non-coding region associated with an allele to be able to analyze for the presence of that allele. And it seemed that this was entirely novel, the idea of looking for an allele not by its coding region, but, but by its non-coding region. And so novelty wasn't the question, um, but the court found that notwithstanding it being novel, it's still essentially just a natural law of correlating the non-coding region, its presence or absence, um, with the uh, with the, the allele, and what um, so the court found that it was in, ineligible subject matter. It was direct to a law of nature that there's a correlation between a certain non-coding region and an allele. And I, I think the next point in the lower bullets about inventive concept is really fairly informative of what courts, at least, are looking for. Um, the court found that there was no sufficient inventive concept in additional claim elephant elements to provide subject matter eligibility. And so what it suggests, to me at least, is that what they're looking for is if you're going to be claiming or you're going to base your claim on some otherwise uh, judicial exception like a law of nature or natural phenomenon, that your claim is non-obvious over that natural phenomenon, not just novel, but that you have some non-obvious inventive concept. And what the courts seem to fairly routinely find is that if you just add well-known 
routine and conventional steps like amplifying or analyzing um, to a natural phenomenon, that is not going to be non-obvious, not non-obvious to use routine and conventional steps. So a, a similar case, um, there were a series of patents in this Cleveland Clinic case directed to a method of diagnosing cardiovascular disease based on testing um, for a certain enzyme. It was found to be ineligible. The claims were directed to a law of nature, the law of nature being that there's a correlation between this enzyme and cardiovascular disease and that beyond this natural um, law, the correlation, like the Supreme Court Ariosa case, there's nothing new here. There's no new technology. Uh, it's just well-known techniques and well-known correlations. And so the testing of patients does not extend the discovery to anything more than the natural. Um, it merely step, claim merely states that those interested do the, the correlation of this natural phenomenon. So uh, again, even if novel, that's not enough. It's got to be non-obvious over the natural um, phenomenon here. It was found not to be. We'll get to um, good news soon, but just continuing the series to uh, bracket some of the ideas of what is not eligible. Um, there's another, there's a Roche case here um, where there was a method of detecting uh, tuberculosis in a biological sample suspects of containing the compound where you subject it to a polymerase chain reaction that would amplify the material if it was there and then you detect the presence of the presence or absence of the amplified product. Um, and the material that is amplified is indistinguishable from the natural product. It just is the natural product amplified and the PCR is a well-known and routine process that didn't convert the method claim to eligible subject matter. So uh, it's again, it falls in line with these other cases of you've got a natural phenomenon, natural correlation between the presence or absence of some information, and then you're gonna make a conclusion based on that. And even if novel, it's just not obvious, it's just not non-obvious to do that and therefore is not eligible subject matter. So, but there are cases in the biologics area where uh, patent eligible subject matter has been found. This rapid litigation case is an important one. Uh, people still try to argue that their claims are more analogous to this um, and to the extent that one is Newly drafting claims, certainly it's a model that one should look towards applicable. And so it was a method of producing a desired preparation of multi product preserved hepatocytes. And the hepatocytes had to be capable of being frozen thawed at least two times. And then the method was injecting the hepatocytes to density gradient fraction, fractionation recovering them and cryopreserving them. And so you can see that there's an argument that this is just conventional steps, um, that you, uh, fractionation conventional, separating conventional, cryopreserving conventional, but the court looked at the claim as a whole and said, that's not what's going on here. It's not just conventional steps on a biological process. It's a new and improved way of preserving hepatocytes for later use. And so you look at that the process steps achieved as a desired outcome of creating um, multi cryopreserved preserved hepatocytes. And you were not just simply detecting whether or not they lived or died from from cryopreservation, you're actually method of producing a certain population, a certain preparation. And looking at the claim this way, it was distinguished from Myriad, a well-known process, and Ariosa, a patent ineligible natural product. 
And so, again, rapid litigation here, a method of actually producing something uh, novel is in the direction that one should be looking to draft patent-eligible subject matter. And now Vanda. Vanda is probably the most important case for um, pharmaceutical methods um, in terms of eligibility. And it's important uh, because you, it, it, it's a method of treatment that is based on doing um, analysis of whether or not the patient is a poor metabolizer of, of CYP2D6. And in some ways, it looks similar to the claims in Mayo, which were a method of optimizing therapeutic uh, efficacy by administering a drug and looking at the metabolite. But it comes out different because of the way that the subject matter is claimed and what it's directed to. And so what's important in the Vanda case is that uh, it, starting with the preamble, that it's a method of treating a patient with iliperidone, so, uh, and the patient is suffering from schizophrenia, so you're having a specific drug to a specific patient, and then within that method, you're performing certain steps, um, including looking at whether the patient is a poor metabolizer of CYP2D6 or not, and then uh, administering based on the termination. And then finally, we probably should have highlighted in green too, the last clause you have that it, it obtains a certain result. So a, a specific drug to a specific population and for a specific result of where you have a lower risk of QTC prolongation um, than you otherwise would with this subpopulation. This is exactly what the court did. The court looked at the very specific nature of the claim, the very specific things that it did, the determining step, the performing step, the administering step, and we've highlighted in the, the middle bullet, specific. It, it's the specificity of the claim that really helped it um, get over the threshold because there may be a, a correlation between dose and whether you're and QT prolongation depending on whether you're a poor metabolizer or not, but that's not what the claim was to the court found. The court found that it's not reciting the natural relationship, but it's reciting a method of treating patients based on that relationship. And so basically it's an application of a natural relationship to achieve um, a, a safer dosing. And so if we were to go back all the way to our slide 40, the PTO new flow chart, it's, there's a natural relationship there. It's clearly a natural phenomenon that's being involved, but it would go through this prong two at the bottom, it would pass this prong two at the bottom, that it's reciting additional elements that integrate it into something more than just a natural to somewhat conclude on the 101 material um, in terms of tips, you know, if you're claiming a natural accept, uh, a, a ju judicial exception like a natural phenomenon, um, you need to look to make the claims non-obvious over that judicial exception, over that natural phenomenon. Don't, don't think that novelty is enough to look for non-obviousness. Um, adding conventional techniques isn't going to do it more likely than not uh, to get that not obvious. Things like correlating, determining, and diagnosing, there's just so much case law on there that these are sort of red flags that are going to make your claim look like they are ineligible, at least look a lot like claims that have been found to be ineligible. So where you're involving a natural phenomenon, want to take it into some practical application like the Vanda case, a method of treating a patient. That's the direction you want to go, a practical application of the natural phenomenon, not just some non-obvious correlating step related to the natural. So additional thoughts on eligibility, to the extent possible, you want to claim um, claims that 
recite something other than a judicial exception, and so we didn't really talk about it today, but non-naturally occurring material, uh, to the extent that that is part of the process, either produces part of your process or a result of the process or can be non-naturally occurring material like cDNA, those are going to be um, eligible even if there are natural phenomenon involved or they should be eligible. Um, and then specific processes like the cryopreserving process under specific conditions, specific processes are also the way you want to be looking to for eligibility. I'm going to move on to written description. Written description for biologics is also um, a little bit of a moving target. Um, at least there's been some substantial changes over the last few years that affect how you claim biologics, particularly in the antibody space. Uh, the statute itself isn't particularly enlightening here for what you need to do specifically for a biologics, but is just a starting point, 112A, you need a written description of the invention and of the manner and process of making using it. What does that mean for biologics? Well, for a time, and this is what I was referring to as some of the big changes that have gone on, for a long time there was an antibody, a so-called antibody exception to the written description, where if you could identify the antigen that would be enough, the antigen, the epitope, that would be enough to pass written description. But what the court said in Amgen versus Sanofi in 2017 is that, no, there's no such antibody exception. You can't just identify an epitope by itself and say that that's sufficient written description for any antibody there too. So this, this antigen-focused test about basic legal principles of written description requirement. Um, and so the USPTO just over a year ago changed their guidelines in view of Amgen Sanofi to say that written description of a newly characterized antigen alone, that's the point, should not be considered adequate written description of a claim antibody. And so if you're prosecuting, you know, this is this is important guidance that you want, to be, you want to claim antibodies to some antigen, you can't just have characterized the antigen. And what the PTO points you to and what uh, Amgen points you to is that you need to look to the conventional tests for written description per Ariad, those being that you need, if you're trying to claim a genus, um, you need either a representative number of species or you need to describe the common structural features. So we'll go through a couple cases. Again, here a few, we'll start with ones that don't pass muster. Um, we have a claim to a method of treating a disease in a subject, and you're going to administer um, a selective targeting compound that is effective to inhibit a certain singling pathway, and wherein the thing that you're going to administer is an antibody that binds to a certain region on that GRP78 surface protein. And so this becomes relatively straightforward post-Amgen to, to say this is at the, the Board of Appeals from ex parte prosecution that post-Amgen, it, it, the specification merely names one antibody with, with affinity to bind to this region and fails to disclose antibody structure, other distinguishing properties. Claims uh, don't present, the claims present the same deficiencies as an Amgen, i.e. they identify the antigen, but the antibodies there too are not described, and so this was insufficient written description for the claims, lack of written description. So if you want to look, uh, post-amgen for a case that was found, involved antibodies and found to be uh, sufficient written description. There's this party Grossmere case, also uh, ex party appeal, and it was a human or chimeric PD-37 specific 
immunoglobulin binding protein, and it had a light chain with a certain sequence. You can see sequence ID one, et cetera, and a heavy chain with other sequence IDs in there, and then wherein the binding protein binds to human CD37. And the, the posture, the posture on appeal um, was was actually in the context of whether the claims were incorporating new matter um, because left out, according to the examiner, some essential subject matter, trying to broaden them. But the, the holding is in the rest of the analysis is still relevant here, that looking post-amgen, here the specification described both the antigen, the CD37, and the CDR sequence is critical to ensure binding. And so this is the type of disclosure that has been found to pass muster under amgen or post-amgen. You know, practice tips for written description, um, they go back substantially to what we all know is the right way to claim anything, that if you have broad claims, you need broad disclosure, and that functional description of, of, your, of your subject matter here in the bio context, affinities to X um, or some assay to identify uh, alone may not be sufficient. Um, something that's also good and didn't really come up in the cases we're talking about is that to the extent you're claiming biomolecules, you want to show that you had possession, possession um, and show your description, the more characterizations you have, uh, potentially the better. You know, you have the sequence, you have the structure, you have the affinity, you have the weight, you do fragment analysis. Any of this information you have, um, you know, it may not be enough alone if you have just for one uh, antibody and you're trying to claim a genus, but these are the types of, this is the type of information that is certainly helpful and goes in the right direction for building your written description support. In terms of antibodies specifically, um, it, it, it just has to be a given now that you can't rely on antigen alone, description of antigen alone. Um, and instead, if you're trying to claim antibodies, you need the antigen plus something. Um, in plus, as in Grossmere, they had specific sequences to show that they had possession. We move on to obviousness. Um, a little more stable in terms of uh, the art than what we've seen for patent eligibility and written description, um, but it's no less important and probably more important. It's, you know, for for IPRs, it's the most common attack on patents, and especially biological patents. So in terms of obviousness, um, again, we just have the, the statute to get us started with the claimed invention as a whole has been obvious to a person of ordinary skill in the art. And I think that um, a, a first important point is, is the concept of routine optimization. There's, there's just more and more cases every year where if you are basing your patentability around some range, a temperature range, a pressure range for, for a process, for example, or a concentration range, and that range is known to be a result effective variable. Um, there are just many, many cases, including this Aspira IPR, um, where the courts are saying, look, exploring a, within a known range result effective variable is just routine optimization. And so uh, it's, it just becomes dangerous uh, to either draft your claims where the only distinguishing feature for novelty or obviousness, I guess for obviousness most importantly, is some range within a range of the art. Um, it, it's, you know, it may not be the case. It may be that the, the range is, is something more or something different, but it'd be good to build in that additional difference so that focus on the claim is not just about a range value. A uh, range value is a, is a hard place to defend. Another example of obviousness in the biological area is uh, this other Hospira IPR that related to a method of testing patients for 
um, GI perforations while treating for colorectal cancer, cancer um, and that was found to be unpatentable as obvious. Every element was in the art before, um, and just based on the knowledge of a person of ordinary skill, there would be reason to combine them. So the, the, the take-home lesson here, if any, is that um, you have to look not to just the literal teachings of references about uh, what, not just the literal teachings of the references, but you need to look towards the general knowledge of a person of ordinary skill on reasons why you would combine references that on their face don't provide a disclosure for their combination. Again, that's not actually distinct in the biological area. This is just uh, an exemplary case. So to the good news, if you're filing a patent, there are um, this Sanofi versus Watson Laboratories case from 2017. Uh, the claim was a method of using a drug to reduce hospitalizations, patients having a history of AFib and at least one cardiovascular risk, risk factor. And what's shown here on this slide, you know, the claim is summarized on the left, but the prior art is summarized on the right, and there was a lot of art here. Um, this patent actually came out of the phase three trials for the drug, and there was a lot of art out there already um, relating the drug uh, and the patient population based on their history of AFib or not, and their hospitalization and death or not. And then even in the art is this final Athena study design uh, that was looking to the very question of treating patients with a history of AFib and at least one CV risk factor with the goal of seeing whether or not hospitalization slash death would be, that was the end point. Um, so the study was designed, the study was public, uh, and in the art before the filing date, uh, it wasn't completed until after the filing date. Um, what it found, though, is that it was not obvious to use it for the specific population and get the specific result. At best, the evidence um, showed that there would be cautious optimism in trying to reduce hospitalization in these patients, but there was no reasonable expectation of success that you would get there, and that um, there was a fair amount of uncertainty in the art, and there were disputes, and there was clinical safety, and there was doubt about it. Um, and so what's really important here, um, and sort of a general thought, is that your, your phase three clinical trials, and you, you might be able to even have a better footing than Sanofi had here if um, disclosures are more restricted, but you have the benefit of potentially being able to claim the phase three results to the extent they're non-obvious um, as a, a, a later patent that is tied directly to what the labeled indication ends up being. Um, let me quickly do one more case in this area. Um, that relates to formulations and, and just point out that you know, formulation cases can obviously be difficult. They, they fall often into the idea of uh, optimizing known components. Um, dosing can likewise be difficult, but here this endo case is a very good example of the uh, patent owner having combined features individually that were known in the prior art but combined them in, into a combined dosing regimen on the right-hand side, a certain dose, a certain formulation, and a certain um, dosing regimen, and ending up with patentable subject matter. And so I think the lesson there is that uh, we have on the lower half of this slide is combining formulation and, do and dosing elements can be valuable. Obviously, you need to be careful not to be so narrow that you uh, make infringement difficult, but um, they can be a very good way to go forward. And then backing up really to the Sanofi case is that
claiming the result of the treatment, the reduced hospital stay, increased tolerability, can be really beneficial for non-obviousness. You just have to consider on the flip side um, whether there are any inherency issues against you on validity, and likewise whether the, you're going to be able to prove infringement of those of those uh, claims. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Thank you, Mark. Before we turn to your questions, we ask that you please complete our brief evaluation survey. Thank you. And now it is time for our questions and answer session. As a reminder, you can participate by clicking on the Q&A button, typing your question into the Q&A window, and then clicking Submit. To get us started, Mark, what are some issues companies should consider when developing an IP portfolio? Well, at the early stage, you need to be thinking about the timing of when to file. Uh, if you file too soon and too broadly, uh, you may not be able to have the written description support for what you ultimately want to claim, but at the same time, you may be building prior art against yourself. And so uh, the issue of when to file your first round of, of discoveries is fairly critical um, so that you are able to claim and protect your area without um, undermining your ability to claim improvements thereof later. And so there's not a specific bright line of what to do except for recognizing that there's a balance in terms of the timing is not necessarily the ideal thing to file as soon as possible. <laughs> you want to make sure that when you file, you're filing with enough disclosure that you're going to have a supportive claim later. And, you know, as the Sanofi case that we just talked about a minute ago pointed out, um, you should be looking to develop IP throughout the life cycle of development. It's not just the early stage where you're laying foundation for some genus that you're going to protect. The later stage where you're protecting the actual product as it gets close to market uh, is equally critical and uh, potentially even more uh, important. Mark, how does the written description requirement for biologics compare with that for small molecule drugs? At this point, I think all signs are pointing to um, they're one and the same. Um, I think that was the, the thrust of the Amgen case is that you need to look to Ariad, um, you need to look to the idea of whether you have a representative number of species and whether if not, you have to describe the common structural features. And so for biologics, just like small molecules, that needs to be the guide. To the extent biologics are more unpredictable than small molecules, the general guidance is that the more unpredictable the area, the more disclosure you need, the more species and or common structural features you would need. Thank you, Mark. Turning to Shana, how can a company identify patents associated with a particular biological product? So that's a great question. If the company files an ABLA and engages in the patent dance, then the reference product sponsor should be providing the company with a list of patents as part of the patent dance. Um, if the company, though, wants patent information before filing an ABLA, uh, it's, it's more complicated. So the Purple Book in its current form does not include patent information like the Orange Book does for small molecule drugs. So figuring out what patents might be associated with a biologic requires a lot of patent searching and analysis, and this can be pretty challenging on both the legal and technical sides. Um, but it's notable that the FDA has actually recently sought comment and even hosted a public meeting last year on whether it should make changes to the Purple Book including to um, include patent information. So stakeholders on both sides have been weighing in and presenting some pretty interesting points. Thank you, Shana. Continuing on with BIPCA litigation strategies, is there a safe harbor for BIPCA litigations like there is with Hatch-Waxman litigations? Yes, there is. Uh, so the, the statutory safe harbor provision, which is 271E1, does not distinguish between small molecule drugs and biologics. 
And we've seen a safe harbor defense argued uh, in at least one BIPCA litigation, the Amgen versus Hospira case for Epigen that we talked about earlier. Um, that one's currently on appeal. And in that case, the jury found that seven of the 21 batches were entitled to the safe harbor defense, but that the other batches were not. And Shana, are there instances where a company has filed a petition for IPR of a patent for biologics before being sued for patent infringement? So on this one, the short answer is yes. Some companies have petitioned for IPR before being sued for BIPCA patent infringement. Um, but one issue to keep in mind is that if a company loses at the board, they might not have standing to appeal. So this was addressed uh, by the Federal Circuit, I think it was last month, in Momenta versus Bristol-Myers Squibb. So Momenta had petitioned for IPR while it was still developing its biosimilar product. Um, and the board ended up upholding the claims, so Momenta filed an appeal, but the Federal Circuit ended up dismissing the appeal based on a lack of standing. Thank you, Shana and Mark. It looks like that is all the time we have today. If we did not get to your question, please feel free to reach out to our presenters via email. Thank you again for attending today's webcast, Biologics Patent Briefing, Prosecution, Post-Grant Proceedings, and Litigation. As a reminder, this presentation will be available on demand in the next week. Please look for an email from us with the access link. This concludes today's Finnegan webcast. Thank you for participating.